Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, uh, Revelation chapter 22. Well, we're getting toward the end of the book, and and uh, I anticipate we'll be done tonight. And this is where we start the. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, my cough is really bad today. Revelation twenty two seventeen. The Spirit and the Bride say, "Come." And let the, let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. We're, I'm sorry? I heard something. We're nearing the end of the book of Revelation. And as John nears the end, he re records a special invitation given by the Spirit of and the bride. I think the spirit obviously is the Holy Spirit. The third co-equal member of the triune Godhead. Some scholars argue that spirit refers to the prophetic writers. To all of the prophecy writers including John in scripture. I, I find that just a little hard to, uh, to substantiate but. Quite a few look at it that way. I think the Spirit here refers to the Holy Spirit and the, the work that he does through the prophetic writers, but I think it's really a reference to the Holy Spirit and not the writers themselves. Bridge? Yes? Says Spirit of Christ. Are we talking about the Holy Spirit? Depends on the context. Okay. Do you have a version that says that for this verse? A lot of New Testament scholars automatically assume that in the New Testament, Spirit means Holy Spirit. It doesn't always. Sometimes it just it means it means the Spirit, which may be God, may be the Holy Spirit. It's that's why I say not always, and you have to really depend on context. Okay. Um, the Holy Spirit inspires the writers to write the message, the exact message that. God wants to send. Remember, we saw just recently in uh, Revelation 22, these things are true. And they're true because God gave them to us. And so now, uh, I think I think it's, it's fairly obvious, I think, that the Spirit here at least refers to God if you, wanna, if you want to say in the generic, but I think also specifically of the person of the Holy Spirit. But I would I would accept God in the generic, not not a not a, not the not Jehovah God, but in generic I mean not specifically the the third member of the Triune Godhead, but the Godhead at Al. Well, I made that confusing, didn't I? When does this take place? Well, that's that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that we're in the recap of the book. And so this is not a statement at the end of all time and, and when we're in the new heaven, the new, new Jerusalem. I think, I think this is, is, is something that is meant to, to be a, like an epilogue to the book. You just heard about all these things that are going to happen, so the Spirit says come. So I think it's, a, it's an immediate statement to the, to the readers in the first century and to everybody in the church age since. Bridge. Yes. That word spirit is the word pneuma, which is usually ascribed to the Holy Spirit. Well, it's it's the word for spirit. It, not necessarily the Holy Spirit. You have to determine Holy Spirit by by uh, um, context. Okay. The bride is a reference to, I think, the universal church. It was to the church that this book of prophecy was written. And John was the last of the apostles of the church and was the last of Jesus' disciples. 
He had become the last living part of the foundation of the church. So the reference to the bride here, I think, is a, is a more specific reference, not to just all of the church, but to the church foundation, to the, to the apostles, the leaders, to the, uh, to the authority of the church. So it is like John is saying, I'm right there on Jesus' side saying, Jesus says, come, and I'm saying, yeah, come on. And I think that's kind of the picture that we have painted here for us. Um, so you're saying, Reb, excuse me, you're saying it's the authority of the church through the apostles rather than us? It, it's, it's really, it's not us saying it, but the, the body of the church. If that, if you can see the difference between that, I, I'm really having a hard time putting words together. The, the, the church has a certain authority that is, is displayed even today through its leadership and how we, how we organize and that kind of stuff. And I think this is not necessarily a statement that all of us are saying to others, you should come, but it is the authority of the church um, given to us by Jesus Christ that is saying it. Does that make any sense? Yeah. It makes sense in my mind, but it didn't make sense in my mouth. So the reference to the bride here is a reference to the church's work in re uh, is also a reference to the church's work in reaching out to people, the authority and the work of the church to uh, to enable people to see the truth of Scripture given by the Holy Spirit to the writers of Scripture. So this is a this this statement: the Spirit and the Bride say, "Come," is a is a statement that says. Look at all the writings that the Old Testament and the New Testament have that tell us what's going to happen, and it comes from the authority of God and is backed up by the authority of the church. Or maybe probably a better way to say that, it comes through the authority of the church backed up by the authority of God. Gosh, too bad I didn't have a tape recorder for that one. Well, it's, it's being recorded, and it, it will be available in some format on the web eventually. If I can ever figure out why I'm not getting video up there. The picture coming to salvation being compared to coming to get a drink of water is found elsewhere. Remember what the verse says. The spirit and the bride say, come and let the one who hears say, come and let the one who is thirsty come and let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. So that's that's uh, 22, 17. Isaiah 55, 1 says, come everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. So that's a, it's a picture, a, a prophetic picture uh, that is, uh, is displayed in the Old Testament and then now again in the New Testament. We also know that God chose before creation those who would believe. And I submit that both are true. And it's a matter, did I miss a page? Nope. Um, it's a matter of a position of what it looks like uh, from where we're looking. Uh, from God's position, he chose us, which means it will happen. From my position, I chose to come to Christ. Both are true. Both are presented in Scripture as true. So the reason I'm saying that is when you look at, again, at, at 1217, it seems like an offer, an invitation for people to come and, uh, and accept. But then you look at, at what uh, Paul tells us, that God chose us before the foundation of the world. And so you have opposing ideas, kind of. But really, it's a matter of position. Where, where are you viewing it from? If you're viewing it from God's standpoint, he makes it all happen. If you're viewing it from our standpoint, we make it happen, or at least part of it. And so the, I, wanted to, I wanted to make sure we got that clarified, that even though 2217 makes it look like an invitation, it is an invitation, and people do have to accept, but God knows they're going to and makes it so that they will. Any questions on that?
I'm sorry I'm not being very articulate tonight. Um, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this, bro in this book. Think about all the things that we saw and heard. And that's what God says he will do. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of, of prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So now we get into some real confusing, difficult stuff. So is this saying that like Joseph Smith, who wrote the Book of Mormon, will in some way or fashion receive all the fake, horrible things that we read in this book? Well, I would, I would suspect that if he's not saved, and being Joseph Smith, I don't know how he could be, um, and so he would be, he would suffer for eternity in hell. I think that's as bad as it gets. So, add to him the plagues described in the book is a euphemism for hell? Well, maybe. Let's work through it and see what we figure out. Jesus now gives a pretty clear and forceful warning. If anyone adds, uh, if anyone adds to what God has said, God will add the plagues seen in the book to the person. That seems clear enough in, in, some, in some standard, right? Some format. And add to the book. Expect to get the plagues of the book. How that me is meant, I don't know. Does, does God intend to resurrect? Well, he, he does intend to resurrect every, every person, some to damnation, some to glorification. Uh, does, does this mean that those that will be suffering in eternity in hell also have to deal with the plagues? Perhaps. It is possible to view this, though, as, as a little bit of allegory. Um, and the plagues are really bad, and it will be really bad. I think probably you want to do a combination of them. Does this so much worse? Is it not? I, well, I I can't tell you that we 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 don't know a ton about it. We just know that that it'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and it'll be it'll be torture and torment forever and ever without reprieve. But we have nowhere telling us that the plagues that we saw in the book are uh, are going to be meted out on people that are in hell. That may be what's being said here. And God could certainly do that over the course of eternity. I just don't know that's what he's saying. And I don't know that it's not what he's saying. So I'm, I'm going to leave it up to you to figure it out. Because I've worked on it and I can't figure it out. Go ahead, Ann. <laughs> I don't have anything constructive, I don't think. Oh, I thought you were winding up to say something. No, I just... Um, well, I, the only thing I could say is some of the people, some of the humans that have walked the earth are going to be alive when the plagues in this book occur and they will experience them. Yeah. But we can't say everybody will. No. No, we can't. All the, all the non human people, I should say. Right. And specifically, what's being talked about here is anyone who hears the words of this prophecy of the book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues. So that's somebody that, that's falsifying the book. That's not all unredeemed. That's people that have added to the, to the book. Um, I would argue that it's possible that... Sorry, I was loading up my, my logos. That, it, that it's possible that God has specific plans for those that he already knows are going to adulterate the scripture. I would also argue... I'm What's sorry. What's the timeline of these plagues? <coughs> well, these plagues are, are primarily, for what the text says, is the words of the prophecy of this book. So, are, is, is, that a, is that specific to Revelation? Which would mean that the plagues then are in the tribulation, or 
is it a broader statement for the plagues of this book, which are are all of which is all of the Bible, in which case, you know, the, the plagues of Egypt and, and so forth. And I don't know that we can adequately answer that because the immediate context, you know, you go back to verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come and let anyone who hears come and let anyone who desires. Uh, that's not the right one. Um, where did I go? Where uh, it talks about the, the prophets. Whose radio's playing? Uh -huh. Not mine. I don't have one. Um, just recently in in um, in twenty two, David or John is is talking about all of the prophets. So is he talking about is he talking about just Revelation or is he talking about all of Scripture? Because both contexts are really there, and so it's hard to say. The, the, the critical point is that if you add to this book, your world's going to get really bad. How bad? How do we describe it? I don't know how to do that. Would that pertain to like preachers today who are uh, adding in, in the sermons and stuff or... Taken away or they're adding yeah, I, that's what I was was about to say that that uh, um, people that I believe that are teaching false doctrine like preterists and so forth, I'm not going to say that they're not saved, um, but by adding or taking away, and pre preterists certainly take away from the text, although they would argue that they don't. Um, how does God give them the plagues? Well, maybe he gives them the plagues before they're dead. I don't know. So, could we just basically say we don't understand precisely what this means, but those who would add or take away from Scripture are going to receive a specific punishment or a special punishment? Yeah, an extra punishment. I think that's a good way to view that. Um, and... I have to be real careful how I say this, but even, I think, people that claim to be Christians, because we have lots of those that teach a false doctrine, and if this is not just specific to Revelation, if it is the entirety of Scripture, those that teach false doctrine are guilty of this verse. And... I get the sense from John, who's writing the last, the last of his writings, uh, shortly before he dies, the last of the apostles, the last of the foundation of the of the church, and he's saying, "Hey, look, we wrote a bunch of things, including what the Old Testament guys wrote. Don't be adding to it, and don't be taken away from it, because if you do, it's going to get really bad for you." One who can verse yeah. yeah. So, I'm really glad God is merciful, though, because as a believer who has taught Sunday school and, and Bible classes for years, I teach, I come across things now, I go, oh, I thought that wrong. It well, wasn't intentional. No. I, I, you know, hopefully that, this verse doesn't apply to that. I don't think it does. Yeah, because he is a gracious God. He's a just God, but he's a gracious God. Yeah. And, and if you, when when I was a medic, we had a medical director that uh, told us if you don't kill a patient now and then, you're not seeing enough patients. <laughs> and, and that's the absolute truth. I mean, if if you're a doctor or a nurse or, or a medic or whatever, you're you're going to make a mistake or somebody's just going to die. Well, the same is I think true if you're teaching enough. You're sometimes going to teach something that's not right. I don't like to admit it, but I have to admit it when it happens to me. And it happens to me way more often than I want it to. But I don't think that means that tomorrow I'm going to get the plagues. I don't think it's fair. Would it, would it be a matter of your, your, your intent and your heart 
when those words come out? I mean, yes. I, I think it's even bigger than that. Yeah. I, I think those that that want to m remove the authority of the Word of God. I will believe anything in Scripture, even if I don't like it. But there are some that won't. Right. And I think that's more in line with what we're, what we're talking about. Right. And this, uh, Deuteronomy 4 2 is the basis of that, which says, You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you. Um, continuing in verse 3 and 4, it says, Your eyes have seen what I did to the, for the Lord at Baal, uh, Baal Peor, for the Lord your God destroyed them from among you because they followed the Baal of Peor. So you held back to the word of the Lord when you are alive today. See, I have taught you the statutes and rules of the Lord my God as he commanded me that you should do them when you turn the land and as you take possession of it. So it just sets the precedent for um, um, not adding to it and, and that God will exact punishment on those that don't. Right. Yep. And I think I think that that's this is kind of a bookend. You've got the you've got the the, the writings of Moses saying don't add to it, don't take it away, and now you have the writings of John saying don't add to it, don't take it away. How specifically we use the words, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. I, I don't know how specific we can get in that. I would like to be able to say that at some point God will, will uh, before the person dies, make them get scurvy and make them get have to drink blood and, and make them get run over by what you know what, whatever plagues are there, right? But I, I, I can't say that. I, I don't know how that applies. We could say that he won't bless, he won't bless them. Well, it's even more than he won't bless them. He's going to actively do something to them. But that's not even the hardest part of this, of this passage to understand. We go into verse 19. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of, of prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. What does that sound like? He'll take away their salvation. Yeah. Oh. We know that can't be possible, right? It, it made me think. It made me think of that first, but after that, it made me think of as being saved as by fire. In other words, being saved, but but, but you have no reward. You have nothing to lay at Jesus' feet. Okay. That's where my head went second. <coughs> fire. So, if any man takes uh, away from this book, God will take away his share. Of the tree of life and from the holy city. Well, could it could it just basically mean that those people are not saved? Well, I mean that would be an easy answer. Oh. That they weren't saved to be in the beginning. I'm not sure we can make that claim, but it is what a lot of Calvinists do. We, of course we believe that God doesn't unsave a person because he chose them before the foundation of the earth. And, and when you look at 828, although I started to read an article today from the uh, Free Grace Society that argues we need to take back, uh, we being the Free Grace people, need to take back Romans 828, 29 from the Calvinists. So I, I, my, I didn't have the mental capacity to read it today, but I will. Um, we believe that God's not going to unsave us. So, we know from the rest of the sal uh, rest of Scripture that we can't be plucked out of God out of Jesus' hand. We know that we can't jump out. We know that we can't be unsaved. So, how do we interpret that statement from John? That's in keeping with the other warnings given in Scripture. And how are we to treat this Scripture? Some scholars argue that only an unbeliever would take away from the text. I don't know that we can say that. I, I just, I, I, I have heard too many guys that sound saved that 
don't use all of the text and don't believe all of the text. So I, I don't know that we can say that. I believe there are many preterists that are probably true believers, but they dismiss, dismiss much of the book of Revelation as not being prophetic. Is that removing from... Preterist, uh, preterism is a, is a eschatological system that basically says there's no millennium, all the events of Revelation already happened, and uh, we're in, I shouldn't say there's no millennium, we're in the millennium. Oh, by the way, the millennium doesn't mean a thousand years. Oh, by the way, I don't want this to be the millennium because it stinks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, preterism is a very common form of eschatology. Um, Gary DeMar is a big proponent. Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible answer guy. The Bible answer man, I think is what his t title is. He's a preterist. And they just believe that all the events of Revelation happened um, and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD was proof. And so they believe that John wrote it in the 60s, not in the 90s. There's so much evidence against them, but they still hang on to that. But I mean, there are people who, a lot of Christians I know, who believe that baptism is required from salvation. Right. I, th I think they truly know the Lord, but they've added something to the text. Well, not in their mind and probably not in actual words. Just go to Mark 16, 16, and you kind of have that statement. You've got to really dig to understand that that statement is not to be interpreted the way it sounds in English, but... Um, you know, in Mark 16, 16, I think it's 16, uh, where it says, be baptized and be saved. Um, but when you look at it, the basis for unbelief, or the basis for condemnation is unbelief. And the basis for belief is, or for, for salvation is belief. In six, I think it's 16, 16. Mark 16, anyway. I'm getting there. there. There's all sorts of ways to argue against baptismal regeneration. But they have scripture on their side as well. They just interpret the scripture differently. I don't think they remove scripture. And I don't think they add to it. You were right. 16.16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Right. And continue reading. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. So the basis of condemnation is not believing. Therefore the basis for, for salvation has to be believing. Both sides of the formula have to equal for it to work. At least that's the way I understand math works. I can't do it, but I understand that. Um, I'm not willing to argue that the people that would take away from Scripture can't be saved. We see in chapter 22 that those who are in uh, that those who are in the new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem have access to the tree of life. We're going to go back to what we've talked about a little bit in the last couple of weeks in the tree of life and what it actually means. And this is one of the reasons. This verse is one of the reasons why I went down that rabbit hole uh, before. So, if we're already in the new Jerusalem, are we saved or unsaved? Saved. And there. Excuse me, and their tacos are really jumping back at me. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. Whoever thought that was funny, because it's... Woo! Um, New Jerusalem will not have any unsaved people ever. As evidenced by the walls and the gates. Of course, the gates are never closed, but there'll never be any there, because by the time we're in the New Jerusalem, all the unsaved are in hell. Right. Okay. So... We're already in the New Jerusalem. The tree of life does not give them access to New Jerusalem because it's there too. So preventing them access does not take away salvation. Does it maybe take away to put a blessing because um, that's supposed to be part of the blessing of being... Um, in the New Jerusalem and the Millennial Kingdom is the Tree of Life. It's yeah, I'm kind of at a loss to determine what the Tree of Life does for a glorified, redeemed person. We looked at it last week where the Tree of Life grants life. Well, it 
can't grant life to a glorified person. And so, because they're already alive, they're already immortal. So, I'm not sure. This is, this is part of a real complex set of, of statements that are made here in the closing part of the book that have lots of, of Revelation scholars going, eh, I really don't know what's going on. It's possible, and, and some scholars, and I, I admit I don't remember what Walverd said on this, uh, it's possible that, uh, that this is another statement, just like the walls and the gates were a statement to show the eternality and the protection of being in the New Jerusalem. We don't need a wall around Jerusalem because nobody can get in that isn't saved, isn't glorified. So we don't really need the tree because we're already, we're already redeemed, we're already glorified. And so it's all just euphemistic statements about the blessings of God. I don't know that... Backing up to verse 14, it says, Thus for those who watch the road so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gate. So they won't have the right to the tree of the light or the city, so were they redeemed? Yes, because John said, Blessed are those that wash their robes, or probably more precisely, have their robes washed. And again, that's a part of that whole complex set of statements that we're going through here in the last part of Revelation 22. What's being, what's being, what are we being told? Are we being told that the tree of life provides immort physical immortality? Maybe, but the people that will have access to it already have immortality because they've been glorified. So is the tree of life in reality, a euphemism for, for eternity in a glorified state. I don't know. I don't think so. Because then why did God put a guard on it in the Garden of Eden? Is, could it be some kind of a particular blessing? Because we're going to be rewarded according to our... To what we do for the Lord, so could it be a type of blessing? That's what I was just looking up in First Corinthians three fifteen. It says that um, <coughs> if his church is burned up, he will be saved yet as by fire. Right. And that somewhere in Galatians, but I didn't get a chance to find it. It says that we that we will cast our crowns or our our, our rewards at his feet. Yeah, so, more precisely what that passage talks about is that the 24 elders will cast their, their crowns and jewels, and we believe by extension, so will we. It's not doesn't specifically say that we do. However, we teach that we do by an extension of that verse. Just want to make sure that we don't make the verse say more than it does. Thank you. But I'm wondering if, I know this sounds really ridiculous, but in, in Psalm someplace it says he'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than something else. So I'm wondering <coughs> if that just doesn't mean that we won't have the best room in heaven type of thing. Yeah, I, I, think, I think in Matthew we read that, that uh, there'll be some that, that are way far away and others that are closer up. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I, I think that that our rewards will determine our our placing in heaven. We'll all be in heaven, but I don't think that's what this is talking about, though. I, I, I can't get past the fact that God put a guard on the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. And at bookends to the Bible, we read about the garden, we read about the tree of life. And so I don't know yet, and this is this is my new favorite project. I don't know yet what the tree of life means. My working theory right now is that the tree of life provides physical immortality without spiritual redemption. Understand what that means. If Adam had snuck back into the garden when the uh, angel was sleeping, yeah, I know, I know, and, and was able to eat from the tree of life, I believe he would have received immortality. 
he would have not received salvation. He understood immortality because he was immortal before he sinned. And when he sinned, his body was then made mortal. And I believe the tree of life reverses that. At least that's my working theory right now. So how does that fit into, into Revelation 22? Perhaps, now just, just go with me and understand, I haven't worked all this out. This is part of my waking up in the middle of the night thinking about it kind of deal. Pondering stuff. Perhaps in Revelation, the tree of life is for those that live through the tribulation, through the millennium, not through the end of the millennium, and through whatever the season is, without dying and being glorified. At some point, God will either have to translate them, like he does us at the rapture. He'll have to poof them at some point. Or let them eat from the tree of life and have physical immortality to go with their spiritual immortality. Or their spiritual eternity. That's just a working theory now. I can't prove any of that. But there's a reason that it's at both ends of the Bible. The tree of life showing up in, in, uh, in uh, Genesis uh, early chapters and now here in Revelation late chapters. There's a reason for that. I just don't know what it is yet. And very few guys talk about it. They just, they just pass off the tree of life as a euphemism for salvation. If that's true, then Adam couldn't be saved because God prevented him from getting to the tree of life. And I'm not willing to say that. And, then, but, and if that's true, then why do, why do the... People in heaven with their glorified bodies have to eat it, eat it. Right. If the tree of life was not factoring so heavily into the middle of the New Jerusalem, I'd be all set saying, yeah, it's a euphemism for salvation. But the people that will have access to it are already saved. So why in, in verse 14, like Linda pointed out, does it say that they'll get access to it? I know I have not answered any questions on this. I've created more questions. I'm sorry. Welcome to my world. Mel welcome to the pain that I feel when I go through this. I don't have an answer. I have more questions. Every time I study it, I come away with more questions. So you know what my working theory is. I don't know how to answer that. I don't know if that's right or not. I just know there's a reason God put it at the beginning and he put it at the end. Well, this is hysterical. I'm researching while you're talking. According to Jewish mythology, in the Garden of Eden, there is a tree of life, or the tree of souls, that blossoms and produces new souls, which fall into the gulf, the treasury of souls. The angel Gabriel reaches into the treasury and takes out the first soul that comes into his hand. Yeah. That's hysterical. We... we we don't know a ton about about Jewish we being the church doesn't know a ton about Jewish teaching but the more you read it in the Mishnah and the more you read about the rabbi's interpretation of the interpretation and the more you read about non-standard Jewish practice, practice like Kabbalah and stuff there is all sorts of mysticism out there I mean the a significant number of the Jewish groups that are in, in, in the world today, even in America, believe that Adam's first wife's name was, Kate? Lilith. Lilith. I, I was hoping you'd help me out there, Kate. It was Lilith. I was muted. Oh, sorry. And uh, that Eve was actually a second chance for Adam. That's Jewish teaching in a lot of places. But here, I thought that the Jews might have a better handle on it because the tree of life started first. No, they they have no they do not have a better handle on anything. <laughs> they didn't have a good handle on it when Moses was teaching them. It got worse by the time they were destroyed in seventy. It was 
It didn't resemble anything like Je like uh, Moses had taught. And the Jewish traditions that are alive today are mostly European and have very little basis in in biblical practice. That is sad. You have to actually go to the Samaritans that are still in place in, in, the, in the nation of Israel today and their practice. The, them and the Jews in Yemen are the closest to good theological Jews. And they're still, they're still not good. What's that? That's bizarre. It is bizarre. So, Tree of Life, spend some time studying it. I don't know what it means. You're not going to find a lot of people writing on it. I hope to someday have this put together enough that I can write on it and people can laugh at me because that's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. So let's move on. He who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. Jesus says he's coming soon. Now remember, Jesus tells John this or the angel tells John this 1900 years ago. So soon has a rather broad definition. Anybody know what the... The church has, has anticipated the coming of Jesus at any moment. You know what that doctrine's called? Imminent, imminent return? Yeah. Imminent yeah. The imminent return of, of Jesus has been a foundational doctrine, well, uh, has been a significant doctrine in the church since the time of the apostles, since before the apostles were dead. The apostles thought Jesus was coming back in days. And those days turned to weeks, that turned to months, that turned to year. And now we're in two millennia since. So the definition of soon is kind of fluid. When you look at um, Moses' description in Psalm 90 verse 4, it says a thousand years in your sight is but as yesterday when it's past or as a watch in the night. So, you know. Yeah, but the other side of the equation is that a thousand years is as a day. Right. A day is, a, is a, as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. Right. Which means... Our timing and his timing are not even close to being the same. Right. That, that word in Greek or whatever language it was when it was written here. Which one? Um, soon? The word soon. Okay. Does it actually mean soon? Well, it all, let, me, let me get you the word. Um, but I'm on my tablet. When I'm on the Zoom, I have a hard time finding those things because it's on my iPad and I'm using it. It is the word Texas, from which we get tacky, like tachycometer, tachycometer, tacha, tacha, holy cow. Thank you. I was putting an extra syllable in there and it was messing me up. It means quick, swift, speedy, in short time, quickly, hurriedly, sweetly, sweetly, swiftly, speedily. <laughs> this is painful. I want you to know. Quick, prompt. Yeah. Quick, quick, prompt, ready, slow. Hear that? Quick, prompt, ready, slow. How did slow get there? Yeah, exactly. Without delay, right away, at once, soon, afterward, more quickly, faster, sooner, quickly, without delay, very quickly, in short time, and quick. <laughs> How do you like that? Well, it must have been that one lonely slow. No, no, it, it really isn't. From our point of view, it is. Right, but our point of view is not what's writing here. God's point of view is. Now, I want you to think about this. God ex exists where? Outside of time and space. Right. So what does soon mean when you don't have time? Anytime. time. With no time. Yeah, Anytime. exactly. <laughs> Doesn't mean anything. Right. <coughs> As the church age gets longer, there's been some teaching that certain events have to happen. Um, I, I remember vividly in the 70s, we were nearing the end of the, 
of the of the generation after Israel became a nation. Israel becomes a nation May 14th, 1948. Now all the Bible uh, um, prophecy scholars saying Jesus will return in a generation from that. A biblical generation is typically 40 years. So when you get when you get into the 80s, the end of the 80s, Jesus has to return by then. And then we get into the 90s, what happens? He still hasn't come back. Well, maybe generation means 50 years. And then we get into the 2000s. Well, may, may, maybe, maybe because we're living longer, generation is longer. These are all legitimate things, or things that legitimate scholars are saying. So, after the fall of Israel in 70 AD, the teaching uh, was that Israel had to be reconstituted. So, May 48, when Israel's reconstituted and actually has a place on the map, everybody thinks, okay, that's it. The reality is, nothing had to happen on the global scale for Jesus to return. <laughs> the only thing that has to happen is God's timetable ticks to the right time. Some, some evangelist would argue that a certain number of people have to be saved. And when that last person is saved, then the, then the, the eschatological clock will start ticking again. I disagree with that. The clock has been ticking. The last person will be saved and the, and the next event will happen, but the next event isn't triggered by the last person being saved. They will all just happen when they need to happen. All that Jesus is waiting for is for God's time. A time that he... It will be gone as long as it was from Adam, the first coming. I wonder if it will be as long from Jesus to the next. Well, that's an interesting question. In my, in my theological framework... That would make make it be that we have another four thousand years to go. I know. Not a problem. We'll be in heaven. Perhaps it won't be a problem, but for all the people in that four thousand years, it will be. Maybe, maybe not. During the last two thousand years, the world has gone up and down. We're not any appreciably worse than we were at the time of Nero. Oh, but I think the behavior of the People is awful right now. Yeah. They weren't so great in, at the time of Nero either. Yeah, just spend some time studying what life was like in the Greco Roman Empire. When Paul tells us to be obedient to the to the government, the government was actively trying to kill them. I won't I won't comment on that. So Jesus says he's coming soon. John replies, Amen, come Lord. He's anxious. He's missed his, his friend now for, for 60, 70 years. He's anxious for him to come. But what happened is John went to him first. So the closing verse of Revelation is, The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Remember, John is writing to predominantly Gentile churches in Asia Minor, in the end of the first century. The seven churches of chapter 2 and 3 are the original recipients of this. Most scholars, most Revelation scholars, believe that John gets off the island of Patmos and he's able to deliver the book, the scroll, to be copied and distributed to the seven churches before he dies. Do you think that the, the letters to the seven churches have anything to do with his, uh, historical time periods of churches? No. I was not here for that part. No, I do not. I, I, a, a lot of people do. Um, I don't believe that they are specific time periods. I think they're specific types of churches. And you can have them at any time period. Okay. Kind of where I was leaning by myself as I was studying, but I missed the whole front end of Revelation with you. So the, the Bible is, is concluded in much the same way that it began with creation. We have creation one, and then we have creation two. I hesitate to use the words recreation because he doesn't recreate it. He makes new. The old earth 
in the old heaven were created in such a way as to have sin as a re- and as a result of sin, death be possible. Many frustrate that God created a world in which sin was possible in planning for sin to occur. Planning so far in advance how God would make it legal for God to forgive us is, is through how he, how he planned Jesus on the cross. How he planned for us to be saved. He, he sent Jesus to a cross, to a Roman cross, so that he had the legal authority to forgive us. Because his righteousness and his holiness demands that sin be dealt with. And so sin had to be dealt with. God's original creation was designed for the failure of man so that man would know God's mercy and grace as well as his holiness and justice. When God's plan has played out and creation 1.0, I should say we're on 1.1, by the way, because 1.0 was Adam to, to Noah. Noah is 1.1. When his creation has reached and accomplished its intended purpose, a new heaven and a new earth will be created. Not recreated, but created. The new heaven and the new earth, sin and death, are not even possible anymore. Their purpose has been served, and now eternity no longer needs them. So death, sin, and pain, yay, are sequestered in the eternal lake of fire. The Garden of Eden was a paradise. Our eternal state will be paradise exponentially amplified. We have eternity to fellowship and serve God. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.